Hey everybody, One Peg here. Uh, sorry it's been a little while. I uh, went to PAX East and uh, didn't have an opportunity to upload to you guys. I've had some stuff going on. But today there was a dev blog with, uh, with Nikita, Demurka, uh, Vlad, and the gang uh, talking about a whole lot of stuff, some of which was really, really cool. So as always, I'm going to try to keep this to like 10 or 15 minutes. If it runs over, I apologize. But uh, hopefully it'll stay pretty short. I got a lot of notes here in my uh, in my notebook. So first off, Nikita started the podcast by talking about how they've added about a hundred game and back end servers. We added like almost one hundred servers, uh, back end servers, and game servers. He made mention of a steadily increasing player base. Somewhere around every week, they see about ten to fifteen percent of an increase. PCU like online continue to rise. Like I said, every week it's 10 or 15%. He said that throughout the day, there are several different peaks in terms of player count going kind of around the globe as each major region ends up having their main playtime. And that happens three to four times a day. Right now, it's like three or four peak moments because uh, the geography of audience, it's kind of worldwide. But since adding the game and backend servers that they have, they've seen a significant improvement in performance. And I can honestly say in the last few days, uh, it seems to feel like that as well. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the weekend now that they've had this podcast and also the drop event, uh, which again, I will reiterate, uh, the Twitch drops events are always a lot of fun, but they are a lottery system. And because they're run by Twitch, Twitch says even in their FAQ that it can take up to 72 hours for drops to arrive. So if you didn't get one, maybe you'll see one in the next couple to three days. And if not, better luck next time. I can say that I did not get one. So <laughs> I'm in the same boat as the rest of you uh, if you didn't have one. Nikita then went on to talk about how there's a lot of new emerging cheaters but Battle Eye is working and is taking care of it. Every single day, there's a lot of new cheats uh, trying to break the, these barriers and uh, infest uh, the game. And the Battle Eye is working like really good and banned like a lot of players, a lot of uh, cheaters. Uh, he said that they've banned a ton of cheaters and many sites that advertise these things have closed as a result. Nikita said that there was a patch coming. Uh, and the patch would be soon, did not give us a date on what he has named as 0.12.4, but he did say that it's almost ready. In previous podcasts, they did say that they were looking to maybe do this content update style of patch weeks ago, but obviously it's now gotten pushed back. He did go on to say that they wanted to release patches monthly, but he did say that this one did get pushed back because they wanted to do something that was a more quality offering. I, I like, I think most people would agree that we would rather see something of a quality offering as opposed to a quantity offering. And if they end up having to push back stuff like this, then so be it. That brings us to the first major milestone of the podcast today, which is the overweight system. The first really eye-opening thing that we were shown were these two stamina bars. These stamina bars have now been divided. The top bar being the arms or hands, and the bottom bar being your legs. So your arms and your legs will now have separate stamina bars associated with them. A couple of interesting mechanics that we did start to notice during the course of the podcast when they were kind of demoing how this all would work. One is if you're holding an ADS and pull the trigger, the recoil of the gun in full auto actually affects how fast the stamina bar drains for the arms stamina bar. The second thing that we noticed was once the arms stamina bar emptied, then the legs bar started kind of coming in behind it. So once the arm stamina bar empties out, your aim starts to get shaky. But then your ability to be able to sprint away also starts to be affected. And that leads us into this weight system. So the weight system changes that were shown also had to do with movement. And there appeared to be two levels to the penalties that you could get as a result of being overweight. The first penalty was one that was referred to as kind of the yellow zone where you're moderately heavy. When overweight in this state, you make more noise when you walk and run, your jump height is reduced, your stamina drain rate is increased, your fall damage is increased, and your movement speed overall is also decreased. They also introduced this mechanic that had to do with momentum, 
where when you don't have an overweight status of any kind, when you go to sprint, it's basically instantaneous. In the case of this intermediate or yellow zone overweight status, you have like this delay where you work up to full speed, kind of like a, a train leaving a station. Obviously a little bit faster than that, but you get the idea. So there's this transitional period from being at a walk or jog into a full-on sprint. And they stated that this transition to sprinting is not kind of just a linear set status. It It's, it's not a switch where it's on or off. It's something that progressively becomes worse the heavier you get eventually leading into this extra overweight status, which is the red overweight status. Now this one, instead of being called medium overweight, they referred to as huge overweight. And I'm not sure maybe they'll end up renaming this or maybe not. Uh, but in this state, sprinting is impossible because of how overweight you are. Your stance height is reduced. You can't stand up at full height. Your prone movement ends up draining stamina. So typically when you are prone, you crawling across the ground don't end up losing stamina as a result. In this state, any movement whatsoever ends up draining stamina. If you're prone and crawling, if you're walking, if you're kind of just trying to move forward at a regular step, and by the way, you actually move slower in this state than if you were to have two broken legs. It's about the slowest possible that you can move, but your stamina drains incredibly fast. It will not recover, and it drains... Uh, even when you're walking. The only way that you can regain stamina in this state is if you are laying prone and not moving at all. But, like I said before, any movement draining stamina means also that when you hit the C key to stand back up or, or whatever key it is for prone, when you stand back up, that motion of standing back up on your own two feet actually causes stamina loss. So any stance that you end up going into or moving your body at all drains your leg stamina. Basically, what BSG is doing is saying you're not going to be able to walk around very overweight at all. This also begs the question, what happens when you pick up a tank battery? In this case, it looks like something might have to get reworked just a little bit um, because they also talked about in the same conversation that there's going to become possibly more of a reliance on stims, specifically stims like the blue stim that gives you extra strength, uh, stamina, endurance, uh, regeneration uh, capacity, that kind of thing. So it's very, very possible we could see uh, a larger reliance on stims. One thing that I want to touch on with this goes back to the leveling of the strength stat as a soft skill. Now, for those of you that don't know, I made a video on how to power level strength that I'll link here for you. Uh, just about all of these methods obviously still work. However, there are now diminishing return mechanics that we've all seen. Idea being is I think you get like six to eight XP points into your bar and then you have to wait five to 10 minutes for the diminishing return to cool off and then you can go back to earning those points again. It takes longer to level something like strength out. In this case though, there is a little bit of a concern. At 51 points of strength, you get an elite perk. Only the stuff that is contained in your backpack is actually counted against your weight. So, heavy armor, helmets, guns, chest rigs full of grenades and ammo, your gamma container and its contents does not count against any kind of weight limit once you get to that elite level perk. You could have the best possible loadout that you could think of or the tankiest loadout that you could think of and none of that is going to count against you whatsoever. Whereas the rest of us obviously will be left to have to deal with those weight issues. So it's very possible Unless BSG changes how the, the meta is with this strength perk, we could see people huddling up amongst each other all over Interchange and, and Shoreline kind of just beating each other in the knees in hopes that they can gain more strength and uh, and get around this, this issue of not being able to carry out fat stacks of loot. We could start seeing metas where a lot of people start wearing the lightest things that they possibly can so that they can hold on to more stuff. Yeah. It's going to be cool. Kind of going hand in hand with this mechanic of these two stamina bars and the weight restriction items, 
there's also the introduction of what they're referring to as fatigue. So the idea is, is if you use your stamina bars too much or too often, too quickly, like people that tend to sprint from place to place using their stamina bar and having it recharge and drain, will actually see a decay mechanic where they have diminishing returns on their stamina bar and its ability to recharge itself and in an increase in the rate of decay as they sprint or ADS. All of this looks like the devs are working toward ways to try and slow down the gameplay. They're working as hard as they can to try and make it so that people aren't necessarily sprinting from area to area and playing hyper-aggressively like a lot of folks have a tendency to do. So from here, we had leaks of a bunch of new items. There was the Splav Tarzan M22, which is a chest rig of 14 squares in size made up of four 1x2s and six 1x1s. The next was an Ars Arma uh, CPC Mod 2 looks like it's going to be the largest and most armored of the chest rigs that we currently have or will have access to. Uh, this one, again, much like the Tac Tech at Class 5 armor, is going to be chest only, uh, but will be 60 points of durability. Uh, is going to have five 1x2 slots, three 1x1s, two 1x3s, and one 2x2, two two, making it probably the most versatile chest rig out of all of the chest rigs that we currently can use. The next uh, that was shown was the LBT Slick Plate Chest Armor, which is an 80 durability point tier 6 thorax only. So no stomach armor with this, uh, this chest armor at all. The next that was shown was the LBT backpack. Now, this one had a medical cross right on it, and we saw at many different points that it had only meds in it, and Nikita confirmed that this 35-slot 5x7 bag was only for meds. The next rig was what Nikita referred to as a little bit of a meme. This is the bank robber rig, which was four 1x2 slots. Very, very simple in nature. Uh, looks like something that we'll see kind of early game. Uh, maybe like a like a tier two ragman or something like that. The next one was the TC800 high cut helmet, which looks like they were pulling something from uh, like the Fast MT or thereabouts. Uh, looked like another tier four helmet with side rails that will be able to take another Fast MT face shield. Uh, I guess we'll we'll see where exactly that fits in, but it just kind of looked like another cosmetic tier four. Uh, they next the next thing they showed was an AK that had the KGB anodized red pistol grip and the stock. Obviously, they are loot only, just like the red anodized hex handguard and uh, the red anodized uh, rails that you could put on the handguard. Next, they showed some uh, some SVD mods. Uh, one was the It's Mash modernization package. Which, was, uh, which showed a handguard and a top rail, uh, as well as a quad rail handguard after that with a, uh, another smaller tactical uh, rail on the barrel. Almost looked like it was sitting maybe on the gas block. And they also showed a bit of a modified dovetail on that uh, modified gun as well. Next, they showed the much-anticipated grenade box that had 64 nade slots and they said would be purchasable from Jaeger. Upon opening the grenade box, they showed the VOG-25, which is the crafted UBGL nade made from the fuses that we've now seen leaked from the last couple of podcasts, as well as the VOG-17, which is a crafted nade made from the grenades from the AGS. Now, what's very cool about this is that the VOG-25 has the shortest fuse timer in the game currently at two seconds. F1 grenades that have uh, potentially a larger blast radius but take so much longer to detonate gives people a chance to get away. In this case, if you're timing it right, two seconds is extremely short, and you're getting like one bounce, maybe, and that thing is exploding. So uh, you have a really good tendency to catch somebody if, uh, if you got good toss aim. Uh, next, they showed Walker's Razor headset. They said that this is a loot-only item found only on boss guards and raiders. And they said that the way that it's EQ'd will be application-specific. Now, I'm not sure where this comes in, but you guys can bet your boots, given my love for audio, that uh, we'll be checking that out and seeing where it lies kind of like in the frequency ranges. 
The next thing that they showed was clothing for the Bears. They showed a Bear Telnick shirt and the Tiger pants or Tigger pants. Uh, they said that they also are adding another outfit for USEX, but they are not showing us what those are because the player that they had to be able to show us was a bear. Uh, we'd have to wait and see what those looked like. He also said that they're adding a lot of new barter items, so I guess we'll wait to see what those are. Then through some gameplay that they showed on Factory, they introduced us to the Scav outfit, which was the new Olympic jacket. <laughs> Which in and of itself is a meme considering that Russia is banned from the Olympics and any other international competition for doping and steroid use. But hey, you know, whatever. Nikita said that the patch after this one will be for pure fixes and optimizations. It will dedicate it for fixing only, optimization and good stuff that you all people want. And then we came to the next large milestone, which was the interchange modifications. Uh, so Nikita said that they're adding new Exfils, so we're going to have new extract locations. They modified the lighting for the entire map, and it looks amazing. And some other surprises that they said that they were not going to show us, and we will have to find out ourselves. What they did show us, though, was very cool. Inside of the power station, on the wall, there is a power switch that turns on the power to the entire mall. Now, this also comes with a little bit of an interesting twist. So, by default, once the map is kind of revamped and live, the whole mall starts off dark. When someone turns on the power switch, it turns on all of the lights. Now, there are still some darker areas, obviously, but one thing that looked amazing was that all of the lights on the map appeared to be breakable. So you can shoot them out. Even the even the halogen bulbs, the big neons up at the top of the second floor in the main area of the mall down that center corridor. Every single one of them was an individual light source. And it looked just great. It really did. Also, they said kind of along with canon or the story of the mall, after this big conflict went down and the entire city got cordoned off, the majority of the mall had been vandalized. So, since all of these stores have been broken into, an awful lot of them have now had alarms added to them. And these alarms, these store alarms, are all going off. Uh, so that was interesting to see. It's a radius. Maybe. So it will be like annoying, you know? You oh, знаешь, куда сгоняю еще? Where? Извини, что я перебиваю. Сгоняю в автомату. Now, some of some of the stuff that got asked from a Q&A perspective, one of them was about Steam audio, and they said that they would be uh, demoing that for us at some point, but it still needed to get worked with. Lastly was a question on when we would expect to see the next wipe. As always, the community wants to know when the next wipe is occurring. As we all know, Nikita said that the next wipe is being scheduled or is estimated to be somewhere mid-summer, uh, late June to early July. I'm not sure if they're going to make that date or not. Obviously, he probably isn't either. But what he did say was with that patch would come some storyline stuff. And the important thing to note about this is that the wipe will come with the first iteration of the main storyline quests, which is something that we've all been wanting to see. Because uh, most likely it will be with the storyline quests, because it, it, it will require to actually te to test the whole uh, line of, of the quests, including the current quest system too. So that's what I've got for the summary, guys. Uh, before we do that, I just want to say a very special thank you to the uh, the sponsor for today's stream, which is my sub button. So, uh, yeah, real special thank you to the uh, the subscribe button that uh, that is right below the, the video. Or at the end of this video, there's going to be another one that looks just like the dog face icon that uh, that you guys could click if, if you wanted to. Seriously, though, guys, I, I do appreciate all the love, and we will see you in the next video. Bye.